it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Praz Murthy all the way from San Diego, California. He was born and raised just 90 miles down the street from me in Tucson, Arizona, and attended Pomona College in California, where he graduated in 2005 with a double degree in math and philosophy. I, I don't think I've ever met anybody had a math philosophy to major. Shortly after, he began working at a Manance, man, math Nassium franchise. Mathnasium, yep. Oh, Mathnasium. So that's yep. with your math major? Exactly. There's actually one in Ahwatukee. Oh, okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and you lived in Scottsdale for what, six years? Yep, just about. Six to seven. Roughly a year later, he bought the franchise for $8,000. Over the next six years, he built and ran the business, selling it in 2012 for one hundred and twenty grand to move to Las Vegas and join his business partners in what would become Dr. Multimedia. Praz is co-founder and co-owner of the online marketing company for doctors. Praz helps thousands of doctors across many specialties manage their online marketing from websites to social media to search engine optimization. Dr. Multimedia is a one-stop shop to manage your online presence. In 2016, Praz moved to San Diego, California to open Dr. Multimedia's newest office in Del Mar. Praz currently lives there with his dog, Wally, and enjoys driving the beautiful Southern California coast each day. So thanks for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's quite the honor to be here. Well, where's Wally? That's what I want to know first. <laughs> Wally, Wally is behind these curtains uh, <laughs> sleeping away on this Sunday morning. So, you know, um, dentists, you know, we only went to school for eight years because we want to we want to help somebody get out of pain. They broke their tooth. They can't sleep, you know. And so I'm always trying to say that's awesome, but you got to focus on the business and the best way to get more toothaches, I mean, a fireman wants a house on fire. A, a, a policeman wants to catch a bad guy. The only way you're going to get a lot of people walking through your door is no longer the yellow pages. It's this online stuff. And uh, I think the millennials get it 10 times more than all the old dogs like me who are 54. But um, what, do you, what do you think um, dentists need to know about online marketing and dentistry? And for, first of all, you're, um, you guys are 25% dentistry, but you started in vet. I'm just curious, why did you guys start in vet first? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's the real answer and there's the business answer. The, uh, the real answer is uh, my business partners and I, we were messing around the internet like a lot of people fresh out of college. We were passionate about Arizona basketball. You know that is the, the name of the game down in Tucson. Uh, and we were doing it as a hobby, much like yourself. We had a forum. We were producing content. Um, and one of our good friends saw that, and he was a veterinarian, and he asked us for help with his website. And the first time he asked, we said, no way, that is the last thing we would ever want to do, uh, help you with your boring you know, veterinary hospital website. But he kept at it, and eventually, just as a favor to him, he treated all of our dogs. You know, We said, all right, let's give this a shot. And what we ended up doing was we brought the same principles that we were using on the basketball side to his website. You know, at the time we didn't really know what would work and what wouldn't work, but the basics of it were regular content, interactive websites, uh, the ability for patients to and clients to comment. Uh, and this was, you know, roughly 2007, 2008, so pretty early in the in that sense. Um, you know, thankfully we were able to help his business grow. I'd love to take all the credit, but he went from about 2.8 million to 3.5 to 4.2 over the course of 3 to 4 years. And uh, the person who owned his practice in Las Vegas happened to own 16 others as well. So when he caught wind of what we were doing, uh, he gave us about half of his practices at the time. And that unofficially was uh, what now is the beginning of Dr. Multimedia. At the time, it was just a fun hobby on the side, a way for some friends to get together um, and you know have a little bit of residual income, but that wasn't really what it was about. Um, from there, uh, since we were based in veterinary, we went to a couple conferences. You know, dentists know all about conferences in the sales floor. And we were able to show off our product, meet people, get a few accounts, and grew very modestly over the next couple years, really crafting the product without a whole lot of attention to sales. Um, we weren't really sales-based because we didn't really come at this from a business perspective. It was just something that evolved. Then about three years ago, uh, we got serious about sales, hired some fantastic sales talent, and that's when the business uh, skyrocketed. And it was right around the same time that we saw the opening in the dental world. Uh, we saw what was out there. We saw the options for dentists. Like you mentioned, um, a lot of dentists had no training in business. They just woke up one day and happened to own a business. 
Um, and my father was uh, is a physician, and so I watched him at an early age. He was either seeing patients, or he's either at the office seeing patients or at the office doing paperwork. Um, and that didn't leave a whole lot of time for business management and uh, you know things like a website or online marketing. So as that came up and, and we scoped out what was in the dental world, well, we realized that we really had something to offer. And so dental, the dentistry, whether it be orthodontics, endodontics, periodontists, general dentists, cosmetic dentists, it's our fastest growing division at Dr. Multimedia. Uh, we actually started as DDS Multimedia uh, because we had a veterinary specific name initially and we wanted to branch out. And uh, about a couple years ago, we rebranded everything together as Dr. So what was your last brand on dentistry? A DDS Multimedia. So if you look far enough back on Dental Town, you will see a couple references to uh, DDS Multimedia as we as we broke into the dental and, market. And by the way, homies, um, none of these are commercials. He didn't. He's not paying me to come on the show. I called him. He didn't call me. Um, but you can go to Dental Town, and on the um, there's a quarter million of your colleagues there. And I thought it was interesting. Pratt said to me early, he said, uh, um, I thought Dental Town was just for dentists. And that was a big debate back in 1998 because a lot of dentists um, said, uh, there's people on here that sell stuff. And I'm like, well, what are you, a volunteer? What do you do, free dentistry in a homeless shelter? Um, I am only a great dentist because of about 500 companies that sell me a lot of great stuff. And if those companies disappeared, I'd be working with a bunch of stuff from Home Depot, and I would not be a good dentist. I mean, could you imagine pulling teeth with pliers from Home Depot? And um, and and if you want to know what your townies think of this stuff, like if I put in, um, if I go to the website, uh, the app, and I type in Doctor um, Multi Media, I mean, there's just pages of threads of what everybody says about it. And then I'm going to go back to your last name, um, which was um, DDS Multimedia. Yep. DDS Multimedia. And you have all these threads saying that U of A basketball sucks. And <laughs> go, go ASU. And, uh, but, you know, and I also want to point out something very interesting. That, um, one other thing is that a lot of dentists are trying to decide – what new procedures they should learn, but you're you're the perfect capitalist. That you you saw demand, so you supplied a demand. You didn't sit there with your philosophy major and sit under a tree and wait for an apple to fall on your head and think of the next greatest thing. It just in front of you. If you got a bunch of poor patients in front of you that just want dentures, then learn how to do mini implants and implants. Follow the lead. And then one last point before I'll let you talk is um um. Most of the big dental supply companies like Patterson, they also do vets because dentists, vets, and chiropractors aren't strangulated by national health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, and all this stuff. And they're the ones that behave most like a business. And right. as poorly run as dental office and vets are, they are ran 10 times more efficiently than the MDs. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I have to go to the hospital about every uh, – 10 years for a couple of days for kidney stones. That's my, that's my weak spot. And, um, my God, every eight hours, somebody walks in there and asks me what my name is. I'm like, dude, I'm naked. I'm in a bed. I got two bands on. I got an IV. How the hell do you not know who I am, what I'm here for? I mean, every time I go to the hospital, I just say to myself, my God, what do they do with like really sick people? Like what would happen if you had a heart attack or cancer? I mean, they can't even, I mean, the, the way they treat a kidney stone patient is so incompetent, it's mind-boggling. I had four boys. Every time I took them to the emergency room, which was regular when you have four boys, they'd ask me, what is your name? What is your address? What is wow. your phone number? What, what, it's just like, oh, my, you know, crazy. So, so vets, um, so now you're 25% dentistry. That's the fast growing. What percent are you vet? Uh, vet, I would say, is about uh, 60 Oh, okay. So 60, 70, 80, 80. So what's the remaining 15? Uh, so it's a blend of, like you said, uh, chiropractors, plastic surgeons. Uh, we've uh, expanded out. I've got uh, some psychologists now. Um, let's see. I, uh, there's, uh, we have some neurosurgery, urology. kind. Of, a lot of uh, private practices are now catching wind or, or realizing that it's time to treat the internet 
like a part of their business, um, as opposed to this inconvenience that they had to deal with in the late 90s and early 2000s because it just came about. You know, most of the doctors that we work with were successful long before the internet. They would, quite frankly, be successful without it based on their medicine. But in terms of growing and expanding their practice in the way that they want looking forward, this is something that they've had to tackle. And so we now regularly get inquiries from uh, niches that we're not even in uh, at the moment because they realize, hey, you know, we, we could make use of this or a lot of times, hey, this is a problem we don't want to deal with or we don't feel equipped to tackle. You know, um, and again, plastic surgeons, they're operating in an area not covered by Medicaid and Medicare. That's why when you go to uh, um, dental uh, countries around the world where the government, like the NHS in England, um, sets all the fees at at a loss, all the dentists are moving into Invisalign and dental implants because they can um, run that segment like a business. They're just using their base of, of loss leaders with covered by the NHS to hopefully pull out one Invisalign case a week for 6,500 or one implant a week or whatever. But uh, so, so what do you think um, all the dentists listening to you right now need to think more about when it comes to their online marketing and dentistry? Absolutely. So I, I want to approach that in three ways because I know you have a large viewership. I know you have a lot of students listening. Um, I know there's a lot of people on their drive to work just kind of pondering as they uh, as try to wake up in the morning. So there's really three aspects uh, of your approach here. Uh, well, let me start. Let me appeal to the younger audience first, and I'm sure you know this. Uh, what, what is your definition of younger? Oh, so I would say anything under 55. <laughs> I would say uh, with <laughs> probably within five years out, either in school or within five years out. And the reason I bring them up is, in our experience, more of that segment are starting to start their own practices and own their own practices than ever before. It doesn't seem like anyone wants to be an associate for 20 years and take over the practice anymore. I regularly am coming across, you know, um, kids of dentists that are either, you know, I'll give you a great example from uh, the California Dental Association. I met a young woman um, who's just started practicing uh, within the last year or two in her father's practice. But rather than join her father's practice, she has decided to start her own practice that operates one day a week out of the same facility. Um, another example, I have a husband and wife team in Indiana, both under 30, uh, relatively fresh out of school. They bought the practice that they worked at from the uh, owner who was just toying with retirement. And rather than kind of keep him on and, and learn, they just made a clean break, took it over and are running it with, you know, their own philosophy. So we see this more and more. Oh, go ahead. But but what, what percent, you get such mixed data, what percent? Of the everybody tells the old people that millennials are all different. You know, they came from right. a different planet. Um, maybe it was a genetic, genetically modified foods altered their DNA or something. Um, what percent of the kids coming out of school want to just they hate business? I want to be employee and work under someone else's domain their whole life. And what percent um, someday their goal is to own their own show? Sure. So this this answer is going to be more anecdotal than statistical. But I would say, based on the people that we talk to, ninety uh, percent don't want to work for someone for a long period of time. Exactly. And when I talk to all the CEOs of the biggest corporate dental chains in the in the world, I mean, and and in other countries, in Singapore and Australia, whatever, what's their number one problem? They associate turnover. Right. Exactly. They can't, they can't keep a doc a box or two. And everybody's always saying that now. You know, the next generation is always going to be different. They're going to be crazy and dumb and and they're not going to be as good as their dad or their grandpa or whatever stuff. But the bottom line is the last two million years, no human wants to live in someone else's cave. No human wants to be told what to do. Humans are the most fiercely independent tribal walking, talking monkeys without tails, and they don't want to be told anything. I mean, they so so all of a sudden the millennials want to be under someone's thumb the rest of their life. I mean, it, w- it would have had to be a complete mass evolution genetic mutation because I don't see any evidence of that in the last two million years of Homo sapien. Well, I, I totally agree with you. And it actually, in my opinion, speaks to a bigger shift in the industry. You know, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, medicine was viewed as a profession above many others in the sense that you didn't really advertise, you wouldn't really market, you know, it would be hard to imagine a doctor on a billboard. They were essentially separate. 
And and lawyers used to be the same way. Lawyers didn't used to advertise. And now you can't you know, can't go 20 feet without a legal advertising. And that came from Tucson. Did you know that? <laughs> That's right. The billboards? No, our right to advertise. It was oh. two attorneys in Tucson. I know them. And really? before 1973, lawyers, physicians, dentists, it was against the law. Just like it used to be against the law for pharmaceuticals advertise. And two lawyers from Tucson uh, were told by the Arizona board that take quit advertising and you're going to lose your license. And, of course, their lawyers say, sued them. They went all the way to the Supreme Court saying, this is free speech. Wow. We only do one type of law. I think they were um, personal injury attorneys. And we want, to, we want the freedom to tell people in Tucson, this is our core competency. This is what we do. And the Supreme Court said, it is free speech. So that started in Tucson. But, it, but when I got out of school in 87, which was, you know, uh, 87, 14 years later, it was extremely taboo. And when a young 24-year-old me took a full page ad in the Yellow Pages and went into a strip center next to Safeway, <laughs> right? all the old guys thought it was guys like me that was going to ruin the profession. Right, exactly. And so, you know, the, the crowd that has been through that transition has had to change their approach to business, whereas I think that younger crowd, that millennial crowd that's coming up, accepts that from the get-go, that these are small businesses that they are running, that there is competition, that they do need to maybe not say that they're better than other people, but they do need to illustrate the benefits of coming to them, as opposed to just going to your neighborhood veterinarian or your neighborhood dentist or your you know, your neighborhood chiropractor. Uh, thanks to the internet, now people are searching, they're researching, and the definition of word of mouth has changed. So, you know, you asked me originally what what do people need to know? And I said I'd, I'd answer it in three parts. I think that that younger crowd kind of comes in pre-prepared, understanding the value of the Internet from their own experience, the value of online marketing. Even if they can't necessarily afford to do it, it's in their plans down the road. Um, then I think you have that middle segment. Just for the sake of argument, we'll call it 30 to 45. Uh, that I fall in that range. They are a blend of the two, right? We didn't grow up as digital natives, but right around middle school, high school, college, we started to hop online. Didn't necess We remember the yellow pages. We remember looking up services and phone numbers. Um, and so they, they see that mixture. They see the older clientele that they have that they believe operates the same way, but they also are now seeing those younger patients or the kids of their longtime patients that are coming in with their heads buried in their phone. I think for them, they struggle with how do I approach this? Is this something that I delegate to an office manager? Should I have my front desk girl doing social media because she's on Facebook all the time on her own? Um, is this something that I need to that I need to learn that I have to worry about? I don't really want to. These are kind of the questions that we hear in that um, in that we'll call that mid segment of the of the population. And a lot of them are also relatively new to practice ownership because they did come from that time when you would be an associate a little bit longer than a couple years um, and venture out on your own. So they may be within five to ten years of starting their business and as I know from experience the first two or three years uh, they're not really worried about this stuff. They have a million other things that they're trying to get right with their practice and the way that they came up in the dental world and that's their concern and they kind of get to this later. Uh, whereas the millennials seem to get to this first even before they've signed the paperwork on their practice. They're already thinking about what's going to go on the website. Then lastly, if you are in that, uh, you know, we'll call it that old school uh, category uh, where you've been, you've been, like I said, successful long before the Internet, don't need it to survive, healthy, thriving practice. At this point, it becomes more of a luxury, a time versus money, um, a delegation versus outsourcing sort of scenario. And realistically, I meet plenty of dentists that say, you know, I've got plenty of patients. Uh, I'm booked out for three to four months. <clears throat> you know, what do I need a new website or internet marketing for? And, and the answer really depends. But ultimately, you, you know, I respond with you. You still dress up nice when you go to work. Uh, you don't show up in pajamas just because you're booked out for three years. You still update the sign out front if it looks uh, outdated. And the same way you want to represent yourself online with that same luxury, um, with that same attention to detail, and really just sell yourself, uh, for lack of a better word, as a thriving practice, one that is booked out, and one that if you are that full, you're gonna get constant word of mouth referrals, and these days word of mouth usually quickly turns to Google as the second step in uh, finding information and looking you up. Well, that old guy, 
he's going to have a hard time turning uh, selling that practice if it doesn't have a big online presence. I I already hear young people saying, well, I got three choices back in Salina, Kansas, but one of them doesn't even have a Yelp review or a Google review or a website. So they just cross that one off. Right. And then they start talking about the metrics of how they see it. I want, I want to start with the young people because they, they get it. They grew up on this. But I'm seeing one huge mistake a lot of them are doing, especially in Asia and Africa and every once in a while in America where they say, well, you don't need a website. I mean, websites are dead. You just do it on Facebook. What would you say to that kid? And there's a lot of them in sure. Cambodia, Malaysia, Africa. Why would I they need a www dot when they just go to their Facebook page? Great question. I think their heart's in the right place. I think they figure that's where all the people are. But anyone without a website, what I usually do if I'm standing with them side by side is I Google them and I show them from Facebook to Yelp to health grades to Google reviews that whether they think they're on these platforms or not, they have pages and people can say whatever they want on those pages. The website is essentially the one place online, your one piece of real estate where you're in complete control and you have complete ownership. You know, Facebook changes their rules on what feels like a weekly basis when you're on the other side of have, having to keep up with those. They can, they can move stuff around. They can delete your reviews. They can, they can allow bad reviews on there. Don't get me wrong. I think that you can reach people that way, but ultimately you have to drive them somewhere you can control. So putting your forms on your Facebook page, allowing appointment requests through your Facebook page that you can monitor and that you have control of rather than them going through Facebook. Um, being able to stash your services, highlight yourself, promote yourself with personalization, customization, and especially for these younger doctors, they want to be able to push the envelope when it comes to what their practice does online. They don't just want a Yellow Pages ad on their WWW, uh, even though that's all, all a lot of people need. So those things can't be done, can't be controlled. You're putting your online presence, which some could argue is your most valuable way to reach people, in the hands of someone else. And don't, I don't think Facebook is going to turn off tomorrow, but whatever they do choose to do, whether it's ads, putting your competitors on your page, they can do. So I would always stake out your own pet set of real estate. If you haven't bought that domain name that represents your business, you can bet your competitor sure is looking at it. That's a very common practice is to, to buy a domain name just so someone else can I, have I got I got two, two questions out yeah. of what you said. Um, I am old enough to, I remember when, Friendster was all that. Then it was my MySpace was everything, and it's gone. Yep. And it looks like Facebook had a lot of their younger crowd leave and go to Instagram, so they had to get out their checkbook and go buy it. Then they had the same problem with Snapchat. They oh, they tried to buy that. Do you, do, you, do you think Facebook is still the 400-pound gorilla and getting stronger every day, or do you think it's starting to plateau, or do you even think it may be contracting? Well, it depends who you're looking at, but yes, uh, there's no denying that social media has come and go. Uh, Facebook obviously came up at the perfect time and has a lot of financial backing, but you said it best. The kids aren't on Facebook. A uh, large part of the reason is that you and I are on Facebook, so they can't really post what they're up to on the weekend if people like you and me are, and their parents are going to be able to check it out. So they just jump ship, and they're always going to jump ship to whatever's new, whatever's exclusive to them, wherever we're not. That said, there's no denying the reach of Facebook, their goal is to get the entire world online, and just the sheer volume. So as of right now, today, the foreseeable year or two, Facebook is going to be the largest audience on social media by far. But the life cycle with any of these seems to be, you become the most popular, uh, the result of that is a lot of people leave, uh, you also have to continue to make money, so you do have things like sponsored posts and advertisements, and people kind of go elsewhere. I'll leave it to the people at Facebook to decide how they're going to stay relevant, but there's no denying that those trends change, and so your online marketing has to change with it depending on who you're trying to speak to. If you wanted uh, to speak to a teenager, you would not go to Facebook. I want to ask you another question regarding your name. I'm 100% Irish, <laughs> and uh, I always thought, uh, and I see you know, Irish name Murphy, and you're Murthy. Um, I've never even seen Murthy before. M U R T H Y. But it. the point being is, when I first saw your name, my brain saw Murphy. I didn't. Uh, my I didn't see the R there because um, you know how your brain does. That? Have you ever seen them where they they'll do a paragraph where the first and last letter of each word is the same, but they scramble the middle, and yep. you read it fluently because that's the way your eye sees. But a lot of these kids, 
Um, you own Dr. Uh, multimedia.com, Dr. Multimedia.com. You didn't go with the website, prasmurthy.com. And I see a lot of kids, their dental office website is their name because their name's sacred. They got it from their mom and dad and 10 generations. And some of these last names, I mean, I, I, I can't pronounce them. I can't spell them. I, I got a friend um, who's Indian descent. His website, his last name is four, I think it's 13 or 14 letters long. Um, what would you say to young kids about going with their name versus a DBA doing business as? What do, what do you guys recommend? So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I'm glad you, you brought that up. It's a question we rarely get asked. But you always want to plan long term. So don't get me wrong. If you're fresh out of school, if you're playing around on the Internet and you want to claim your name and put some information about yourself on there, that's fantastic. But just like you mentioned that millennials don't want to work under someone else forever, they also don't envision themselves being the only doctor in their practice forever. All of their plans are to have associates, to build a successful practice, to reduce their workload over time, and be a business owner you know, at some point and run the business. So when you take that approach combined with what people are searching for, you know, people don't search for the name of the dentist, especially if they don't know them. They search for dentist near me. They search for Del Mar Dentist. Uh, if they're new to the area. Uh, if they're driving by, they rarely register the name that's on the board if you put your personal name on there. They're more likely to capture the name of the practice or ideally you've got your domain name on your marquee out front because uh, it's actually more effective than putting your phone number on the marquee out front. But So in all those ways, you want it to be easy to spell, easy to remember, as short as possible. You know, full disclosure, Praz isn't my full name. It's Prashant. And for a variety of reasons, most people call me Prize. Online, it's shorter. Uh, it's easier to type. It's also a little bit easier to remember, and it stands out. You know, if you had to spell Prashant, it would be a little bit more difficult than if I get you the first, than after the first time you see Prize. So, I, I so how do you spell Prashant? Uh, P R A S. The beginning is the same, and then it goes H A N T H. So nine letters. H A N T H. Yeah. So yeah. And see, I, I, I assumed it was P-R-A-S-H-A-U-N. See, there but, you go. Yeah. And, 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 you and my, name, my name is so simple, Faran. I mean, it's six letters. It's two, three, far and ran. And right. nobody, nobody can spell it, pronounce it. it, it fair, fair, Faran, you know, and, and they write F-E. And if I say Howard Faran, I mean, it, it's so names are very, very serious. Yeah, well, and, you know, the unfortunate downside of the Internet in the digital age is that no one can spell anything anymore, <laughs> let alone names. So we've got abbreviations for everything. And we're starting to see that in domain names, you know, dentist for you with the number four and the letter U, you know, things like that. Uh, your, you know, your smile. We're, we're, they're doing it all out there. What I'm embarrassed about is if I lose my iPhone, I can't even call my four boys. I don't know any of their phone numbers. Uh, that's right. And imagine then the uh, the dentist who tells me, oh, well, they have my phone number. They'll be able to call and look it up. Like you said, outside of my home phone where I grew up and maybe a couple other numbers, I don't commit any phone numbers to memory and even fewer addresses. You remember the time when you had to know the address of where you were going to find the place. Uh, now we all just you know blindly follow the blue line on our phones. So uh, that's absolutely part of when you talk about name recognition, branding, awareness, promoting yourself as a new business in the community, when you think about how much space in people's brains you're competing for, really the simplest thing you could ever do is get them to bookmark or save your website or know how to get to your website on their mobile device and that's going to be their gateway to all the other information you want to deliver to them. Okay, I uh, I own Dental Town. I don't know how to bookmark a site on my iPhone. How what what did, what did that even mean? Sure. So when, next time you go to your website, at the bottom you're going to see a square with an arrow in it. Uh, press that. Uh, you might have to thumb through, but you're going to see Add to Home Screen as an option. If you press that, a little square is going to pop up on your iPhone that looks just like all your other apps, and it's going to say Dental Town. And so the next time you want to get to Dentaltown, you just press that button and you no longer have to go to Google, type in Dentaltown, risk making a typo, go into the wrong page. You just, you're just you one touch away from the websites that you want to be at. And you know to the normal user, it looks and feels like you have an app on your phone when really it's just the website. Okay, I learned something new from you. Thank you, Proz. <laughs> you're um, welcome. What, what do you think are the, the uh, biggest mistakes? I 
let, let me go through what I think first because whenever that, like if you emailed me, I'm just going to hit reply. Or if you have your website link, I'm going to click it because I'm just wondering who you are, where you're at. You know, are you in Tucson or, or Kathmandu? And I would say that um, less than 5% of the websites even look like a C. They all look like they bought it at a dental convention 5, 10, 20 years ago. They're the uh, they don't have any video. So like when I see you, I can feel your chemistry, your energy. I already like you and I've only been talking to you for a minute. I like the websites of the YouTube video where a dentist is talking. I'm going to say, oh, I, I trust that guy. He looks really nice. I think he's listening to me because they're always thinking the doctor's going to talk down to him, condescending, bitch him out because, you know, they do everything wrong. They don't brush. Um, their, their, their picture looks like a mugshot at their last DUI. Um, you know, there's, uh, and, and you can tell they haven't done anything with it for five years. What, what do you, and, and if they, they, um, imagine if you wanted a, um, a cosmetic procedure, um, uh, veneers, but they don't even have any before and after pictures. Right. And then if they do have before and after pictures, like say dental implants, you know, that half the people that look at that picture, they can, oh my God. I mean, it's like. The titanium sticking out of bloody gum, a suture. I mean, just gory stuff. What What do you see as the common pitfalls on websites? Well, that was pretty well put. If you ever want to join <laughs> us on the sales floor, we can, we can sure use that perspective. No, you're absolutely um, right. When it comes to the mistakes out there, and we'll skip past not having a website. We kind of went over went over that. But I, I would break it down into thinking of it as something that's static or thinking of it as something that's dynamic. So, you know, in, in my opinion, when, when a potential patient comes to your website, they're not really looking for your phone number and address. They are if they're in the moment of contacting you, but if they're in that initial research phase, they're trying to build some element of trust, some level of comfort with you and your practice. And the best way to do that is multimedia that's kind of where our name came from it's the pictures of the practice the outside the inside you know when you drive by a beautiful practice whether fair or not you assume that if they're that invested on the outside that they are equally invested on the inside of that practice when you see uh, smiling faces happy patients you know as much as we've been in the dental world we sometimes we forget that it's a scary experience for a lot of people and something that they're nervous about and a lot of them put off scheduling or you know, I can't imagine the number of times a spouse has asked the other one if they schedule their dental appointment yet. And they say, oh, no, not yet. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at that. So with with the day and age that we have now, you know, you know I needed a barber yesterday to prep for this interview since I was going to be on screen. And I'm new to <laughs> Delmar. So I, I don't have my uh, my regular guy available. So, you know, I typed in uh, barber near me and I'm thumbing through the options. And I won't say I made my decision based on reviews or based on proximity, but they all played a part. You know, if someone popped up with three stars out of five, that's not the guy I'm going to gamble on, you know, 24 hours before I need to be on, be on screen. Uh, same way, if someone was 25 miles down the road, it didn't really matter how great they were. I probably wasn't going to make it in. So when you think of the website and your online presence as dynamic, then you have to keep up with all of these things. You are keeping up with video. Once YouTube became popular, you wanted to be on there. Once um, websites got faster, then you want high quality photos on your website. You know, now that people, e even the older folks out there, like my mother, she's on her, her iPhone uh, using it to contact businesses. So now you need the mobile version to be smooth and huge buttons uh, and easy to dial phone numbers. So if you go into it knowing everything's changing all the time and my website needs to keep up a lot of the things you mentioned become second nature because you're always again trying to establish trust and comfort with what people are seeing and like you said the, the reason we do this as a video podcast is that people will watch it uh, we could have just done the audio and people could have listened to it and if you're in your car yeah but if you're at a computer you might get more out of seeing us watching us our facial expressions as we interact uh, the backgrounds even. I don't know what you're going to put on behind you. I'm curious to uh, to see. But so all that said, if you view it as static, then you really do treat it like that yellow page ad or that brochure that you put out. You do it one time, you get it right, you set it, and then you forget about it, or at least you don't revisit it on a regular basis. And I don't blame people that do that. I totally understand. 
Designing a website is a scary endeavor. It takes a lot of time. It takes time away from all of the regular business functions you and your staff have to do. The, when someone finishes that process, the last thing they want to do is go through it again. So I get that a lot of people are of the mind that we did it, it's up, they did buy a, a website five years ago at a dental conference and it, it has not changed since and that was the opening that allowed us to come into this industry. But if you take the just a mental approach that this thing is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, I joke that it's a living and breathing thing. If you think of it like that, well then you're not going to ignore it, you're not going to just let it go, be out of date. You are going to look at it. You know, a lot of dentists asked them the last time they looked at their own website, and they can't even tell you the answer uh, because nothing's changed on it. The, the, it should be the same as it was two years ago, in their opinion. And what's funny is just with my friends, just the ones I know, like the ones who are like totally into implants. Well, you'd never know that in a second if you went to his website. Uh, other ones are, are members of the AACD and really pride themselves in cosmetics. They don't have one. You'd never know that from their website. I mean, if someone went to some of the best implant doctors I know, no one, I mean, a brain surgeon wouldn't have ever guessed on their website. Pitfalls, or, or, or here, here's another complaint on Dentaltown. I had a website company, and then I decided to change it and found out I didn't, I didn't own any of the, the, the website, the data, the content. It was, wasn't even mine. And they, they didn't know. What, what, what are some of the um, um, things to look out for? Yeah, with people well, uh, building your website. And again, you uh, you can stand there at that booth with us because I didn't even put this in the notes, but you're hitting you're hitting all the major points. So absolutely. Uh, again, because it, websites and online marketing a scary, daunting thing. Because most dentists don't have any training in this, everyone's looking for that solution. And and I don't blame people when they're walking around on that exhibit floor. You see something that looks halfway decent. You see the low price tag, and you go for it. Unfortunately. A lot of them don't know the questions to ask. So for all the listeners out there, there's essentially three areas you've got to be 100% sure of before you commit you know, your online presence. If you remember, I said the reason not to go with Facebook is that someone else owns that real estate. Someone else is in control of that. So first and foremost, do you own your website? You know, Howard, you just mentioned you kind of learned that the opposite direction. You figured it out when you didn't. Um, and a lot of dentists are in that same position. They have what are called template websites from large companies where should they choose to cancel or they want to leave, they'll actually lose everything on the website because the rights to the content, the rights to the design, the layout are not theirs. So even if you had invested time over the years keeping it up to date, customizing it, uh, making it appealing, you are at risk of losing that, you know, at the sake of just missing one month's payment. And you know, a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to cancel my payment. Just to give you some ideas on the opposite side, I had a dentist call me about a month ago saying he got hammered on his taxes. He needed to free up the budget anywhere and everywhere he could. Uh, could he have a couple months off from our marketing services? Now, he owns the website, so he's in a position to ask that. Otherwise, the website's one of those core bills that you can't get rid of without losing your website, and that's going to affect your business. Um, just another... Uh, one, the floods out in Louisiana. Had a couple clients that had to close their doors for three to six weeks while they remodeled. Again, if you don't own your website, your content, you are basically handcuffed to those companies. Uh, outside of that, there's just the quality aspect of it. You've no doubt seen many a dental website that are exact copies of each other because that's what these template companies do. So you've got to own the website. The way you do that is either by building it yourself or by going with a company that offers you full ownership. And a lot of people ask me what that means, but to me it means you're not in a contract. It means you're going month to month with your services, your agreement, and if you stop, everything that's been done up until that point is yours. So any good salesman will be able to talk around the question of whether or not you own your website. They'll say, of course you own your domain, this, that, the other thing. The number one question I want your viewers to kind of deposit in their mind if they're ever in this conversation is, what happens if I stop paying you? If I stop paying you, do I get the website? Do I get the content? Is there anything that you take back? Um, and what kind of contract that I'm in? So that would be the biggest one by far. I think along those lines comes with the customization. So are you going to be in a situation where you've got a template website, the product they delivered you is an exact duplicate of anyone down the street, and then you've got to go in and customize it out and make the changes and the edits. Because ultimately that gets delegated to your staff. 
not really the people that you necessarily want doing that kind of thing. Or do you get to build from the ground up with help, uh, you know, and, and a company that's going to customize it out because of exactly what you talked about. People have different specialties. People have different interests. People, different dentists are better at different things. And well, well, yes, once you get uh, your general dentist and you often have that patient for life, when they need that advanced procedure, when they're in an emergency situation, when they're contemplating cosmetic surgery, they're out there doing research. And you may be able to capture someone else's general patient because of your specialty or your expertise or your results in the community. And that's when you want to showcase it. You know, I had a doctor up in uh, Bellevue, Washington. First time we did the website, it was family dentistry. Uh, beautiful website, lovely lady. Uh, and she gets to back to me about six months after we launched. And she said, you know what? I love cosmetic dentistry. And I forgot all about that when we were going through this process. I want to be a family and cosmetic dentist. So you know what happened in those next coming weeks, before, after galleries, patient testimonials, um, pictures of herself, more pictures of herself and some of her cases, um, you know, more social media of, of their patients that weren't just there for their cleaning. And that really helps promote not just to her own patients, but people that know her patients that, hey, you might not love the idea of doing cosmetic dentistry at your general dentist. So just so you know, here's this option down the street and you may want to check them out. And then you go to the website and you learn all about it. So ownership, customization, and who ends up doing all the work, I would say are the biggest three pitfalls that my clients ran into before they met us. So I know everyone listening to this, probably 85% are commuting to work. Uh, the average commute's an hour. That's why the show's an hour. I always retweet my uh, guest uh, last Twitter uh, I'm at Howard Ferran, and I retweeted uh, two of your tweets, at doc underscore multimedia. One is your uh, reception desk properly receiving new clients. And then another one, um, top 10 social media marketing strategies for orthodontists. Um, we have Dental Town and Ortho Town and Hygis. We have a lot of orthodontists listening right now. Is social media different for an orthodontist than it is a general dentist? My, my goodness. It is uh, almost a 180. And, you know, these are lessons we did not know going in. Like you mentioned, we didn't sit and wait for the apple to drop. These are just lessons we picked up from rolling up our sleeves and being in there. So the first orthodontist we ever had, all we knew was to treat them like a general dentist. And we very quickly realized you're in, you're in a different world. So first of all, you are dealing with kids. So if you're trying to post your, the kids' pictures of their new braces on Facebook – you can be sure none of their friends are going to see it, right? They're on Instagram. They're on Snapchat. They're, they're out on those newer social medias. Uh, but more than that, when you're an orthodontist, you really are only looking for your new patients in the moment that they need you. You know, I'm not out there Googling braces. Uh, my, co my, uh, co my colleagues, my cousins, they aren't doing it until their kids need braces. So you're in this unique time frame where they get told that they need braces or Invisalign or whatever the case may be. Then they're out there looking. Now the whole world is available. You know, I have a cousin in Ohio. She told me she went, she took her 13-year-old son to four different orthodontists for consultations. Some were high tech and the kid loved, some the mother loved because of the price tag, and they kind of negotiated in between. So there's that research phase. Then once you get them, you know, you have that patient anywhere from two to four to five years. And they're coming back in regularly. These are high-cost procedures. Some people are paying cash. Some are being covered by their insurance. Uh, the decision-making process is very different. So not only is that research and trust element so much more, uh, I'll say, relevant, but the money that orthodontists are putting into competing for those same new patients is astronomical. You look at cost per click in dental versus orthodontist, you're playing two different ball games. So... The orthodontists out there, they've actually been much, much quicker to adopt online marketing, and the industry there is much more developed and savvy and diverse than the, a lot of the options in general dentistry because they aren't quite there in terms of the competition. And you mentioned that word when you talked about CEOs was turnover. You know, the the uh, patient turnover that an orthodontist is going to see if they do their job well, they're always going to be replenishing, whereas a general dentist can kind of be growing that base. And I will say one last thing to the orthodontist listening out there, because the first time I heard it, it kind of blew my mind. It may be commonplace when you're in the industry, but I think it always helps to repeat. I had an orthodontist tell me very on, he said, Praz, my website's geared for kids, but I can't tell you the number of times a parent's bringing their kid in for braces, 
they're sitting in the waiting room and then when they when they're done they say you know doc i had no idea that you did adult work if i'm sitting here for an hour anyways while my kids getting this work done well why don't I get a thing or two done? Why I'm already here. I, I've always wanted to. I've never wanted braces, but now I've got Invisalign. And the fact that they could open up this whole other segment, they've already earned the trust of the mother. The kid wouldn't be there if they hadn't. Now they just have to offer the options to the mom um, and, and or, you know, or dad or, or older sibling to say, hey, come on in. You know, you don't need full-fledged braces, maybe just a, a tray you know, that you put in overnight, whatever the case may be. And they've seen a large uh, boost in their existing ba patient base, just a simple moves like that, tailoring their marketing to appeal to adults as well as children. I had uh, the opposite experience with uh, my son Ryan here. Uh, when I uh, turned 50, I had to get a colonoscopy, and he went with me, and I said, well, Ryan, since we're both here, why don't you just get one too? <laughs> and uh, now, now he won't go to the doctor with me anymore. That um, sounds like a Father's Day gift to me, Ryan. <laughs> On, on that cost per click, can you give any dollar examples? I'm, it's probably different for every city, but like, what's it? What's a? Were you talking about Google AdWords? Uh, I was. It was. And like, what, what's a like? What's a uh, typical click cost for a dentist versus yeah, an orthodontist? I'll, I'll just give you uh, some rough numbers. You know, dental, and we're talking about uh, dentists near me, teeth cleaning, those kinds of items. On a mid, you know, medium sized town, medium competitiveness, you might expect about four dollars a click. Okay, just to give you a baseline. And remember, that's not $4 a view. That's only when someone actually clicks on your ad to come to your website. Orthodontist, now you're talking about braces, orthodontist, Invisalign. You can see anywhere from $8 to $10 on average. So you're seeing a considerable jump. And then in competitive areas or densely populated areas, it can skyrocket to 12 to 15 to I've even seen $20 uh, dollars per click. And that's just to get a person to come look at you. What's the highest cost per click of any industry in any city? I assume it's Manhattan What that you've ever seen. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, I've seen if you get far enough down, I've seen it in the hundreds. But yes, um, some of the most competitive are legal. Um, you know, the, the lawyers out there that they're just competing with each other. And the thing to keep in mind is that Google AdWords is an auction. Uh, it doesn't seem that way, but it truly is. So just like any auction, as demand goes up, as more people show up to the auction, prices go up. So a lot of times you want, if your budget is limited, you want to go after the low-hanging fruit, the terms that not a lot of other people are out there going after, rather than just throwing your minimal budget into play with, uh, you know, with the big businesses. You want to advertise for braces, you know that Invisalign ads are popping up, you know, no matter what town you're in. If you're going to be a general dentist, you know those corporations are investing a lot of money uh, to beat out the private practices. So you can, you can spend hundreds of dollars when you're talking about lawyer legal fees or some of those plastic surgeons even. If you're looking at breast implants, you can be spending uh, an enormous amount per click. But those are very um, specific calculations, and they've done the math backwards to realize that they only have to convert one out of 20, one out of 30 of those for it to be profitable. Um, so those are in at least— So what, our, he, what he really said is if you hate— these uh, medical malpractice law firms, you should uh, just Google that and then just start <laughs> clicking their ads all day long. That's right. And, I, uh, I heard the most – one time I heard this, I think it was from The Economist years ago, that the highest click cost was a personal injury attorney in Manhattan. That's right. That's and right. Uh, so just Google personal injury attorney in Manhattan. You start clicking the shit out of all those ads. Just <laughs> just give them, give them some feedback on what you think of the lawyers. No, I'm just kidding. But – um. So, uh, so let's get down and dirty. This is uh, Dentistry Uncensored. What do you cost? What do you do? Um, are there contracts? How, how, how does, how does DrMultimedia.com work? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, you know, I've always been doing uh, these answers in sets of three. Uh, it's no, no coincidence that uh, the last infographic we put out was three keys to Google AdWords. Um, but so the, the three things that separate us from everyone else. The first is no contracts. We go month to month with our service. Uh, we don't believe in, in you having to pay us. Now, are you married? I'm not. Well, we'll keep that advice. No <laughs> contracts. There you go. That's There's, right. You don't need a contract with a consultant, a website, and a woman. Those are the. Th that, that's my three. There you go. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, you no. Know, make sure that you have that you are not in a long term commitment. Uh, and oh, that they, sounds even better. That's right. Yeah, even better. You can get out of it. So uh, that's number one. 
Uh, and, and, you know, the same goes for dental, the dental profession. If I show up and I sit in your chair and I have a, a terrible experience, I'm not locked into coming back six months later just because I came in. You don't get to take your, the fillings back out of my teeth if I, if I decide not to use you for the follow-up. So, you know, you guys are at mercy of that train of thinking all the time. And so somehow in the web world it became, well, oh, of course I've got to sign a year or a two-year. I even heard a five-year contract the other day. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense in today's landscape. Too much can change. Uh, the second, it goes along with the contract, but full ownership. You'd be surprised how many people don't own their website that we talked about. With Dr. Multimedia, you own it from day one. Uh, it's yours, right? licensed and registered to you. You can do with it what you please. You can leave us on day two if that's how short-sighted the game plan was. You know, There's nothing we can do to stop you. But our clients aren't really there for the initial build. They're there for the, the monthly service. Does, so, it, does that mean you build it on, what do they call it, a WordPress document? Yep, yep uh, exactly. Right now we use WordPress exclusively, not because it's the latest and greatest technology, not because it's the fanciest. My developers are always coming to me with options that they think are better. But for exactly what I mentioned, if I build it in some proprietary platform and you leave me, well, you're screwed because you're not going to know how to go in there. You're not going to be able to do anything. You're always going to need the company, and that's intentional. You can see from the company's perspective why that's so much better. Building in WordPress, it powers about a third of the Internet, most commonly used platform. Any web developer should know how to do it. It's kind of like the alphabet if you're learning English. You've got to be able to do WordPress. So as a business owner, you're well protected that should you leave us, should you just not be able to afford us anymore, whatever might happen, whether you sell the practice, Someone else can just pick up where we left off. So build in WordPress. So you asked how much it costs. For that reason, we do have an initial setup cost. A lot of companies will dangle a low or no setup cost in front of you, but they'll get you in a long-term contract or they'll own the product. But that setup cost can range anywhere from about $1,500 to about $4,000, depending on what services we're providing. Then more importantly, we have a monthly fee because, like I told you, we think it's a living, breathing thing. We would hate to see a website get put up and then forgot about You can imagine if someone built a website two years ago and hadn't touched it, the number of things it wouldn't be equipped to deal with, excuse me, whether from Facebook to Instagram to YouTube videos to linking to having Twitter on your actual website so you don't have to retweet, so the tweets are just there, that kind of thing. Um, so we go month to month. You own the website. The monthly fees range anywhere from about $100 a month all the way up to $1,500, $2,000 a month. Uh, depending on what we're doing for you. Uh, I should, probably shouldn't say it, but I've got a member out there on Dental Town. I think she negotiated her way to about $70 a month about three, four years ago, one of my first dentists, and we never raise her price because uh, you know, you're month to month and you're grandfathered in. Lastly, especially now when you're talking about time versus money, is that we do all of the work for you. I mentioned we're a one-stop shop. We're a full-service solution. So we know doctors are busy people. Not only was my dad a doctor, but being of Indian descent, you know, about 70 to 75 percent of people that I knew growing up were doctors. Um, we understand <laughs> We understand that between your personal lives, your work, seeing patients, you, you really don't have time for a lot of the auxiliary things. You know, a business owner, uh, you know, like a, uh, if you owned a solar company, you've got a lot of your day to sit around and play with your advertising, your online marketing, really get into the nitty gritty of the cost per click and the details. These are things that my doctors want me to handle and then to report back to them. You know, they're too busy to even remember to ask me about these things. I have to go out of my way and text them or send them an email. They don't even want to get on the phone a lot of the time because, because time is so precious. So we do all the work, whether it's website changes, whether it's social media posts, whether it's filming the video, managing your online reviews, putting out that custom content, those email newsletters. We're going to do it for you. You can be as involved or not involved as you want. Usually there's a superstar or staff member. Excuse the, the children running around. Everyone's having fun today on Father's Day. That's uh, awesome. Uh, we will, you know, we can help. We can do it for you. We can work in conjunction with that office manager to take the reins on it. And a lot of the younger doctors, they know it's important. They want to have some oversight, but they don't have the time to get in there. Um, and even to write the bio page. You know, they can't tell you the number of times I've done a call like this. Maybe not an hour, but we'll record a five to ten minute conversation. We'll go back home and type everything up because if I had to wait for the doctor to do it, six months later I'd still be waiting. So just to reiterate, month to month, no contracts, full ownership, we do all the work for you. That's what separates. Start, start, and what, what do the fees start at? Because I know you got bronze, silver, gold, platinum, diamond. Yep. 
So bronze ranges, you know, anywhere from about $1,500 initially uh, and about $150 a month, I'd say. Um, all the way up, diamonds probably around 4000 initially and uh, up to about 2000 a month, depending what we do for you. But I should also preface that with everything we do is custom. So we build custom packages at custom prices. Those packages are merely outlines of our most popular offerings and price points. Uh, because as important as this is, as much as, you know, I would love to tell everyone to invest thousands a month. We also understand the nature of the industry is not quite that of business ownership. You know, most of these practices are one, two, three million dollar a year businesses. And if you looked at that, in, if, you, if I removed the word dentist and just showed you business A generating one point five million dollars this year and their online marketing budget was twenty four thousand dollars, you, you would scoff at that um, at that discrepancy that such a small percentage of their budget went to marketing. However, if I grab a dentist and I sit them down and they made $1.5 million and I'm asking for $2,000 a month, that is a very large expense. You know, and they are a medical business, so they have overhead. They have employees. They might have insurances to deal with. We get it. But the more you lean to business ownership, the more these costs look like no-brainers. The more you gear yourself to the kind of medical professional, the more you are likely to look for the lowest number you can because you accept this like your power bill. It's kind of a sunk cost. I need to be on the Internet, but I don't really want to play. So we have a range of services for everybody, but what we've found is the more they view it as a business and a marketing expense, the more they are able to justify those increased costs. And most people don't start out at 2000 Most people come in two, three, five hundred, whatever's comfortable. Just like when you're trying to get a patient in the chair, you want them to be comfortable and you gain their trust. We do the same, and they often will work their way up once we can demonstrate some return and some value. I want to. I want to go back to the name. Do you, do you need to go, or are we cool? Or no, we, no, are we good? not all day. Just, just gotta call my dad when we're done. Okay. Um, I, uh, I've already talked to all my poor boys today. That that's it's, it's the most special day. Um, I um. You know, when I look at the big brand, you know, I've always told Dennis to steal all your ideas from the Fortune 500. Why reinvent the wheel? All their names are two syllables. Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. And then their name is San Diego Cosmetic and Laser Dentistry. And you're like, what? I mean, and, and, and then their name might even have an apostrophe in it. And it's like, what would, what, 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 I mean, should they try to find a two-syllable name? Is that what you would recommend? Or should they be the San Diego Institute of Facial and Cosmetic uh, Dentistry. Yeah, so again, if we're looking at it from the business perspective, um, I won't say that it has to be two syllables. Shorter is better, but you want to be memorable, right? So the reason that those those uh, names exist, they're two syllables, those were all made up words, right? They didn't exist before the company. But you can go to almost any corner of the planet and the person knows what Google is. So they... They, and Google actually just stole a word and, and repurposed it. Facebook and you know invented it based on what was going on on Harvard. So you want to have that ability to be easily remembered. Again, given people's attention spans, giving their inability to smell, spell uh, long words or, or even simple words. You know, orthodontist. You can't imagine the, the variations of the correct spelling that end up in Google when people are searching. So the idea is. If you can make it catchy, if you can make it easy to remember, if you can shorten it, great. But, you know, uh, I had a kid smile, you know, pediatric dentistry. Wow. Pediatric, pediatric dentists are kind of the first to hop on board there because they're appealing to that younger crowd and they want and they want the moms and they want to have that fun, playful aspect to it. You know, uh, Bellingham Smiles is a client of mine out in the Washington area. You can you can try to capture that location. Uh, and easy to remember. If you can't get the location in the name, it's fine to try to get that in your domain name. You know, you can have your business name something the same as the guy across the country. You cannot have the same domain name as the guy across the country. That is truly unique real estate. So when it comes to picking your domain name, you may need to work location in there. But outside of that, you want to play off of what would someone driving by remember. And, you know, uh, just to, I don't want to take up too much time, but I had a, a fun story from the other day. Uh, me and one of my salesmen, we were at a conference, we were driving around, um, and we went by a strip mall, which is, we you know, where a lot of dental offices are now, and on the marquee, I saw orthodontist. So the first thing I said was, hey, Mike, pull up their website, let's see if they need our help. And I realized that the only other thing on the marquee besides orthodontist was silverspringsmiles.com. No phone number, nothing. 
And it was obviously we're driving. So this was all a couple seconds after I saw the sign. I realized in that moment, you know what? If that was the phone number, if that was really anything else, that information was lost forever. I was in a foreign city. Uh, to me, it wasn't my hometown. I wasn't paying much attention to it. But because it was Silver Spring Smiles, I could remember that. I could tell that to Mike. And now if I ever did want to find the phone number, find the address, get the name of the doctor, I've got an easy path to that one that I still remember six months later. Um, so in that sense, you're going to brand the name of the practice. If you want to be San Diego cosmetic and facial implant surgery, you know, try to grab um, San Diego dental implants .com, something where someone's going to be able to remember it and and to cash that away in their mind. You'll notice, you know, the websites of, of many, many, many businesses, even the ones you see ads for. Like you said, outside of your four sons, you might not know a single phone number anymore. Yeah, I don't. The, my mom's the only phone number I still remember at my, my own dental office. That's it. My mom and my dental office. And and um, if you had $100 to spend, would you spend it on Google AdWords or Facebook uh, ads? If those are the only two choices? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, no, a just tell me where if I gave you $100. And oh, you sure. prioritize where you would allot Absolutely. that money. It's a it's a very uh, very not rigid, but right now it's a very set pyramid. So first and foremost, in your website and your online marketing, again the real estate you control. If you only have a hundred dollars, put that into the elements that are going to pay off for you long term. That's one of the reasons we go month to month. Over the course of two years, even at a hundred dollars a month, you're going to have spent twenty four hundred dollars. So if you're just getting the same product every month and you're just paying to exist. You're no better off two years down the road than you were, and you've still invested the same amount of money. So invest that money in improving your website, adding to your website, growing your website. Even if you don't have a company behind you, you know, one month take that $100 and spend it on a graphic designer to improve your logo. One month take that $100, spend it on a writer to write some content for you and edit it. Make sure you're improving your website. If the budget gets slightly bigger, Go after that social media. Uh, try to get some regular posts on there, some fun content, pictures from in the practice. People often forget that anything you have your staff do, you are paying for that time that they're spending on it. So if, that, if the receptionist spends three hours on Facebook that week, that wasn't free. Those were three hours she could have been doing something else to help your practice that only she could do. From there, I would focus on you know photography, video, kind of the fun aspects, making your website interactive. And then... Even though my answer to your question was Google Ads before Facebook Ads, budget-wise, Google Ads is going to be the last thing you put in place because it requires the most substantial budget. Google will tell you if you show up even with $300, you're essentially throwing that money away because it's not enough to see a meaningful return, and you're going to walk away thinking that AdWords didn't work, and they're going to tell you, well, you just showed up with an auction with less than money than everybody else, and you're complaining that there wasn't enough things for sale. So... I would, if I only had $100, Facebook over Google because Facebook ads are cheaper. However, $100 isn't going to get you anything on Google. If you had $2,000, I would go to Google first before I would go to Facebook ads because that can generate you some fast return on, on your investment. But generally speaking, there are certain building blocks you want in place. And a lot of dentists make this mistake. A uh, large part of it is the salesman calling, you know, Yelp's calling you on the phone. Um, you're getting solicited emails. SEO companies are contacting you. PPC companies. This is why we try to be a one-stop shop. But everybody wants a couple of bucks for do some element, and you end up spread thin. And I found that a lot of dentists are investing heavily on steps three, four, and five without ever securing steps one and two. And so just make sure that you have a plan. You know, the number of dentists that have an online marketing plan, very small. I uh, have that plan and that process to where you're going to invest and when you're going to invest and realize that some things you really have to work your way up to. You don't want to diversify too early if, you're, if your core isn't strong, if your website, if your social media aren't good. Don't worry about paying to bring people to your website because you're really just investing for them to see a subpar product. Um, how, why is it that on, on Dental Town um, we have uh, 50 categories, and that, that's the main difference between Dental Town and Facebook. Facebook is just an endless feed. You, it doesn't really have a great way of categorizing the information. You know what I mean? I always say Facebook's a mile wide and an inch deep. You could show me a final picture of a root canal, but you're not going to teach me how to do a root canal. 
And when I um when I go to dental websites, oh, so we have fifty categories, and one of them is marketing. And dental websites falls under marketing. It's marketing, dentist websites, building your website, social media. But when when you do a search on downtown for like Google AdWords, there's a lot of constructive talking or Facebook or whatever. But dude, when you Google Yelp, every thread is negative, negative, negative. So I every time I've ever got an email from Yelp, I just delete it. It's like it's like I feel like you're you're joining the mafia or something. What what why is that? Why does every why is there so much anger about Yelp? Sure. Uh, great question. So, and, and this harkens back to my, my comment about web real estate. So if you, Yelp is one of those areas that we can't control and they make it very frustrating for us to try to control. And by us, I mean Dennis out there. So not only can anyone go say anything about you, a lot of times when you do get someone to leave a good review, it filters out. But really the core of it, you know, everyone wants to think of Yelp as a review company. In my opinion, they're actually an SEO company, and that's search engine optimization. And what's so frustrating about Yelp is that you can't Google a business without bumping into their Yelp page. Yelp's kind of cracked that code as to how to show up. When I Google Howard Brand and, I, and a Yelp listing comes up for you, they've kind of captured some of that real estate. So you don't hear as many people complain about health grades or WebMD reviews because they don't really show up when people are looking. So someone looks for your business, they see your Yelp page. If you have a low rating on there, you freak out. Every, you know, Dentists take these bad reviews personally, even though that's the, the wrong approach. Then when they do go to get good reviews, they get filtered out, and so they're stuck. So they're, they've got their hands in the air. Then Yelp keeps calling for $300, but Yelp will be the first one to tell you that $300 gets you nothing when it comes to your reviews. But I think the best way to sum up people's frustrations with Yelp, when you go to report a review, uh, to flag it, basically saying, hey, Yelp, take a look at this and take it down. There's a, a variety of options as to why that review should be taken down. And the first one on there is it contains information that's false. And if you pick that option, you get an automated response that says, Yelp does not take sides in factual matters. So they're essentially telling you they're not interested in truth. They're not interested in navigating arguments or, or taking away someone's review because it's because it's false, they're staying out of that game. So when I see that, I say, all right, Yelp's made it very clear that they don't care about what's true or not. So that was, as you can imagine, as a medical professional, would be incredibly frustrating in the days of malpractice, you know, lawsuits and, and word of mouth and online reputations. If the company that controls all of this is telling you that people can go on and lie and they don't have a problem with it, that at its core is extremely frustrating. So just as a side note there, any listeners, if you are trying to get Yelp reviews removed, don't pick that option. You need to get them on some of their terms and conditions like um, vulgar language, um, not representing a personal experience. I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but I do think this is valuable for your listeners. Um, if you read the Yelp's terms and conditions, they have what they call a fly in the soup policy. So a Yelp review is supposed to describe an overall consumer experience. So if I go to a restaurant and I get a fly in my soup, Yelp actually doesn't want me posting pictures of that or leaving a bad review about that because it's not the typical experience. It's the exception. So you can imagine, though, how many bad reviews are written about the exception to what a general experience is. So the number one point I've had with success in getting Yelp reviews removed is is appealing to Yelp and saying, look, this wasn't a typical personal consumer experience. This was the mother of the person that was in the chair. This is the brother on another account. This is someone complaining about the weight room when there was the, the, the commute to the practice when there was traffic and construction outside. You try to get them on those areas. So to answer your question, that's why the negativity about Yelp. If I said, I'm going to tell the world about your practice but I'm not going to pay any attention to what's true and what's not. You'd be pretty frustrated with me when the bad stuff comes out. And uh, unfortunately, for better or worse, that's what a lot of dentists fall victim to. And they think that paying Yelp will solve that problem, but Yelp will be the first one to tell you that it won't. So in saying all that, should, should people buy or pay Yelp or get their services? Or just so I would call that step six in that um, in that pyramid that we're constructing. If your website's great, if your social media is really good, if you if you've got Google AdWords humming along, if your 
you know, your staff is, is delegated and working on this thing as a team. Yes. Then if you have another 300 and up, Yelp is a great place to put it on there. Now, do I necessarily think people are going to Yelp to find their dentist? No. But is your Yelp page showing up when people are researching you? Yes. So I have seen a lot of success through Yelp advertising. What I have, but what the pitfall is if you're doing that without those other elements in place, you again, you're investing money in a tool that's meant to drive traffic to you, but then that traffic is coming to a subpar product. You promised me an hour. I've already got 10 minutes over. I still got a couple of questions. Are you, do you, I, I don't want to be, nope. I don't want to be bothering you on a I, Sunday on Father's Day. I've already, I, I celebrated my four boys last night. They're all gone today, except for Ryan. And, um, but can I ask a couple more questions? No problem. I'm having a great time. I'm here as long as you need me. And, uh, my dad will be happy to know I was working this Sunday morning. <laughs> um, the, the still people just ask oh, Angie's list. Yay. Nay. Is that something you see it on TV all the time? Yeah, that's a, that's a tougher one because that opens up the door to a countless number but of, first, first of all, what is it? I always wonder how are, where do you get the money to buy all these television ads? Right, right. So, I mean, if, 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 you're, if you're up there saying, oh, this is the best plumber in town, well, who the hell's paying for that ad on TV? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, and I haven't checked recently, so I could be a little outdated here, but it, from my understanding, Angie list, Angie's List was tied in with Craigslist, or at least the rise of Craigslist. And Craigslist was personal ads, people putting up whatever they wanted, whatever they wanted to sell. So Angie's List was essentially the business version of that. Let's help people find businesses in their area and rank them. Like Craigslist, full of a bunch of noise, bunch of junk. It is, you know, you, you kind of pay to play or at least the where all that money comes from is that these websites first have to get people on them. Then once they're on them, they have to generate some money. And that money almost always comes from businesses. You know, Yelp doesn't charge people to go on and read or write Yelp reviews. But once Yelp got big enough and their funding, they had to show some money in return for their funding, well, they had to go capture some money. Same for Facebook, same for Google. All of them get their money from businesses. And those companies don't really care if this is a good investment for your business or not. They will take your money all the same. So I would have to be pretty far down my online marketing list to consider Angie's list, or I would have to have a specific reason why I want to, to be on there, or maybe I have a personal relationship with my Angie's list rep and they're giving me a good deal and I want to try it out. And you know, I think that speaks to a larger question in marketing and one that leads to a lot of frustration for dentists is that nobody knows the one silver bullet in marketing that's going to work. If we did, we'd all just do that. You know, marketers like myself would be out of business. And anyone that tells you, oh, this is, this is definitely going to work and you're going to see X return on your investment, they're just lying. It's actually the best tell of a bad marketer is when they, when they guarantee you X amount of results. The truth is, none of us know exactly what works, but we all know that when you do these things that I've mentioned in combination and you do them well and you put it out there, that the results follow and trying to untangle backwards exactly which one was giving you the best return on your dollar, that's what having someone helping you with your marketing is all about. But you, So I never want to tell someone not to try an opportunity because you should try it and see what happens. However, I do think there's a fairly um, smart order to what you try and Unfortunately, every one of those companies that need your money from your businesses also have salespeople contacting your business. And again, as a, as a business owner that might not have any true business training, you're kind of at the mercy of a good sales pitch and what sounds like a good idea because you don't want to shortchange your business for $50 a month, $100 a month, $200 a month. Well, sometimes when I review dentists' operating expenses, I'll find 10 to 15 of those $50 to $100 a month bills and when I ask them what they're getting for it, they'll have no idea. But it's a low enough number to just fly under the radar. As long as the practice is growing and new patients are coming in, why mess with the marketing budget? So I'm not saying cut that and, uh, and go to zero. You know, Henry Ford had a famous quote. Uh, I'll update it for today. The person who stops advertising to save money is like the person who stops their clock to save time. Right? So that's not where you cut money to save money. But... I do think if you only had 400, 800, 1200, there are certain areas where you want to invest that first and be secure. 
Um, because Angie's List is only going to give you a return as long as you're on Angie's List. Your website, your social media are going to give you a return as long as you have your website, as long as you have your social media, even if you pull back the reins on that budget. Um, the, the number one genius that understood that Henry Ford quote was Michael Dell, whose dad is an orthodontist. When, really? Do you know yeah. his dad's an orthodontist? I did not know that. And his brother's an ophthalmologist. I had dinner with him, uh, um, at the Texas Dental Association, like in the nineties. And, uh, um, Michael, you know, his dad's an orthodontist. Mike comes home from school after, uh, comes home after one week of college and moves back out and says, he, he's like, what, what's going on? He's like. I met every one of my teachers. Every one of them's an idiot. I'm done. <laughs> and and him and his wife cried that night. And he said, well, can I use your garage to start uh, this idea I've got, which was Dell Computers. But in the March 2000 crash, when, I mean, the NASDAQ had gone from like 1,200 to 5,600 in March, it just, it just collapsed. Dell was the only one who tripled his marketing budget with, hey, dude, got a Dell? And he was the only one growing sales and earnings. And he was saying in the Wall Street Journal, he goes, he goes, all my competitors are cutting their advertising. I tripled mine. Right. He said, it's going to be harder to get business. So I tripled my marketing. Just a couple more questions. Sorry, but they're asking, what is ZocDoc? Uh, great question. So ZocDoc is a platform. It was originally meant to connect patients to doctors. So we all know the situation. You need a doctor last minute. Your doctor's booked out or doesn't have an appointment for two weeks, but you need to see someone today or tomorrow. So ZocDoc, I believe, started with the intention. I don't know the early beginnings, but when they came to market, they had the ability to fill that need where if you're a doctor, you sign on for ZocDoc, you can put out some times that you're available today. If someone needs a doctor today, well, you'll pop up. They can book an appointment with you. They'll come in. Had no idea. I think it was July 4th, uh, 2001 or 2002. I had an issue with my eye. I was at an internship in Washington, D.C. I needed to be seen that night. No optometrist or ophthalmologist that I called, you know, in regular practice had any openings on a Friday. I had to go online and, and Google, you know, who's available right now and make some phone calls. So that's how they started kind of filling in people's schedules. Now they're a, a bit more robust of a platform. They are an online platform for doctors. You can get reviews on ZocDoc. They can promote your reviews. They have featured listings. So again, once they got enough people using their product, now they're going to take money from doctors to have you show higher than the other guy. Um, they also can do what we call microsites. So a lot of people that don't have a website, they at least have a ZocDoc site, meaning there's somewhere online you can go to get their basic information and book an appointment. Um, but of course, it is a paid service. So it works beautifully in conjunction with a website. If you can have your own custom personalized website and that request appointment button goes to your ZocDoc page where they can then select an available time, even if it's last minute and come on in, that's how you get more out of the products that you're paying for. Too many of the dentists I work with pay companies like ZocDoc or Yelp or Facebook, and then they don't have these elements on their website. And that actually speaks to what you mentioned about your Michael Dell quote. You know, I read that a large number of consumers view a lack of advertising as a sign of a struggling business. So that's kind of why you don't cut to save money and why Michael Dell went the opposite way. He wanted to show them, hey, Dell's not in any kind of trouble. We're doing great and we're growing. And kind of that prophecy filled itself as he invested more in his sales and marketing. So whether you're a struggling practice or not, when someone goes to your website and they see a five-year-old website or it's all broken, the links don't work, whether it's fair or not, that can be a sign of someone who's not investing in their marketing and that can be a sign of someone whose business is struggling because why wouldn't you put one or $200 towards this problem a month unless you were really trying to tighten the latches? You know, And that's not always the truth. So let me just say that up front. That's not always the case. My doctor back in Las Vegas, my dentist, he had the worst website. Um, it didn't work on iPhones, didn't do anything. I said, Doc, you know, what's going on here? He said, you know, well, I'm booked out six months in advance. Uh, you know, I don't really know what it's going to, you can't more book me up, you know, having this website. I'll get around to it. It's something that, that I, I've been afraid to do, blah, blah, blah. I moved out of Vegas, so I couldn't help him out because he was pretty resistant to it. I checked it the other day, still the same website. So he's a healthy practice. He's thriving. Someone with that impression would be wrong, but it's still the impression that they can have. And it is the impression that I had the very first time. I went to see him because I thought 
man, maybe this practice is in bad shape. They can't even get around to updating this website, and it turned out to be the opposite. Um, they say an upcoming trend is that on your website you'll be able to schedule your appointment, and Open Dental um, is open, and I and they they have a feature where you can um, put, add to your website. Are you are you seeing that growing in demand? Yeah, well, it's certainly growing in demand. We all, as patients, want to be able to to log on and schedule an appointment. You know, my joke about millennials is if you let them make an appointment without ever talking to a person, they'll do it. The last thing we that they want to do is call, be on hold, leave a voicemail, have you call them back, right? That's almost an invasion of privacy now, calling their cell phones. So if they can Uber or uh, Airbnb, if they can tap their way to their, what they want just showing up in front of them, they will take advantage. So the demand is there. On the dental side, the supply isn't is catching up because you know there's always the fear of schedule appointment versus request an appointment. So if I schedule an appointment 10 minutes from now, your staff might not have the resources to actually act upon that, and then I'm going to show up in 10 minutes and and uh, if, with the attitude that I made an appointment. Why isn't everyone catering to me? So. We have seen almost everybody on board with using their websites to request an appointment. Um, and a large part of that is because there's all the hours that you're closed, which are the main hours that you know working people are doing these kinds of things. And you want them to be able to let you know when that they're going to come in, when they're available, without having to call and wait on hold. You know, when, when they're at work, they're not able to call. And if you put them on hold, they're really not able to stick around. They're trying to do that on their lunch break. So the uh, the idea there is everybody wants to be able to request an appointment. All of our websites allow for that. Some people put you know 24, 48 hour disclaimers on there saying don't use this if you need to be seen within that time frame. Our staff will reach out to you. That said, all those practice management softwares are seeing the money in services like Zocdoc, in some of the platforms, your demand forces, you know the the systems that integrate directly with your practice management software and do allow someone to truly schedule an appointment and be on the books, that's definitely popular, definitely wanted. You need to have the infrastructure in your own practice to handle those kind of requests. But everybody, everybody listening should have request an appointment on your website and have someone checking that email. I can't tell you the number of bizarre situations where that's come in handy. Something is off the wall as I got a message that said, um, please email me back, I'm deaf. I've seen one that said, hey, I'm at work. Don't call my cell phone. You know, I can't pick up, but I need an appointment tomorrow morning. Um, you know, we've seen it all in terms of who will use those forms to contact your clinic on their terms. Um, you just said you just kind of walked into another can of worms because, um, um, well, well, first of all, as far as scheduling online, doctors are afraid these people are going to show up or whatever. And then you say, well, what, what are some of your biggest problems? Uh, no shows and cancellations. <laughs> right. I vote for 30 years. I've told my patients, I name my office today's dental. And if you have an emergency, you don't call the hospital. You just go down there. I right. said, if you have an emergency, I mean, we're open Monday through Friday. Just come down here. You don't have to get a hold of Jan or me or Valerie or whatever. Just come on down. And for 30 years, that walk-in emergency or that person coming down has balanced equally with a no show or a cancellation. Right. And, and the hospital, um, when you walk into the emergency room, you don't walk into the surgery. Every dental office needs to have an emergency room. And, you know, when you have three chairs and they're scheduled all day long, then, then you don't have an emergency room. And the doctors who don't have an emergency room usually net to the IRS about $50,000 a year less. And every oral surgeon has two extra chairs. Every endodontist has two extra chairs because the endodontist is going to catch the fish. He might not necessarily do the root canal there, but he'll get you out of pain, give you antibiotics, Vicodin, Oxycontin, whatever Prince was on. Um, you know, you catch the fish. You don't have to cook, clean, and eat it. And uh, but 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 last question because I feel so bad. You're on a Father's no, Day, no. and uh, but the, now now all the dentists show um, they live in fear. Now they're all afraid that they're going to get sued by the Americans with Disability Act because a deaf yeah. person went to their website and it, your website wasn't in Braille or didn't have text for the video. What well, is that? Is that real or myth? I'm so glad you brought that up. In fact, it was it was my poor planning to not put that on the agenda. But I am getting uh, questions from every corner of the country about this from my current clients. So 
I don't want to discredit the American Disabilities Act in the slightest. So we absolutely want to cater to them. So take this, take that as, as the forefront. However, that particular email going around is more or less legal communication from lawyers looking to make money off of people being afraid. You know, it's no different. My mom got a call the other day on her landline that said that I was going to be arrested, you know, in 30 minutes and the police were on their way uh, to the house if she didn't turn over some kind of information. And, you know, she called me and asked about it and said, okay, first of all, if they were doing that, they wouldn't call you and tell you that they were on their way. But the point was, <laughs> it was a completely fear-based fear system. And anytime you implement that, it's a numbers game. So if I email out a million dentists with some kind of fear-based claim that they could solve for 100 or $200, you can be rest assured I'm going to make some money off of that because some people are just going to pay the bill and move on with their day because, you know, it, it sounds fine. So in the body of that email, there's a long list of things that you should do, uh, and they intentionally make it sound very difficult, very challenging, wanting you to question your website provider from top to bottom. And don't get me wrong, these are nice questions to ask, but the way that they frame it is like, you need to do this or you're going to be the victim of a lawsuit. What we've done on a front line of defense is the number one thing on that list is that there should be a disclaimer at the bottom for people with disabilities as to how to access the information that they might need and the ways to get around it. If you take care of that, now, again, remember the lawyers are looking to make a buck. So they're going to make some money off the initial email. Then once they run dry on that, their next step will be to send the follow-up letter to make it look like they're taking legal action or attempting to take legal action. When they do that, they're going to go after the low-hanging fruit. So if you've taken the first two or three steps on this list, they have a much weaker case than if you've just ignored it completely and they can kind of hammer you with fear. So we're putting that disclaimer on our websites. We're starting there. There are some considerations. Yes, if someone is blind, is your website going to be easy to navigate for them? What are ways we can do it? Technology does have solutions. However, blind users also go into using their computer with some tools that help them pull out what's on the internet. Really, what I took away from that was, if you design a lot of extra bells and whistles on your website, if you have things people have to be able to do to access your website, have people with disabilities in mind. If you only have your phone number on there as a means to contact you, have deaf people in mind and give them some way that they could reach out to you. If you are putting a, uh, a spam filter on your website that requires you enter in a certain code, um, and it's a picture, you know, have blind people in mind where have there be an audio option that they, the, the computer will read to them what they need to type in to pass those filters. That's how I viewed the letter. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. But I've seen enough of those complaints in the places they're, they're coming from to know that, hey, look, take the first step or two. The easiest one's the disclaimer on the site. The ADA gives you the disclaimer that you can put on the bottom of your site. That's going to be your first level of protection. But outside of that, you know, how many people are actually going to court and losing because there's some real damages on their dental website? No, we need to see those numbers before we take it more seriously. But no, keep them in mind when you come up with the brand new idea. Put a disclaimer on your website and keep in mind that doctors are some of the easiest business owners to frighten uh, because of what you deal with in your profession and that malpractice is a very serious thing, lawsuits, the insurance you pay. No one wants to come within five feet of that. So if I call you and tell you your, your domain's about to expire and uh, you're going to get blacklisted on Google unless you pay me $20, you can't imagine the number of people that have paid the wrong company $20 to register their domain name when really their domain name's sitting at GoDaddy and they paid you know XYZ domains because they got a letter saying that they were out of compliance. Damn, you are so smart. You're like, <laughs> uh, I mean... What an orator. You, you, you're like Socrates. I, I could listen to you. You just flow. You can tell there's so much there's so much horsepower behind those uh, that larynx of yours. Uh, I mean, really, you just, you just, it's been an hour and a half. I was going to talk to you for an hour, and uh, Ryan said uh, when we started, Dad, don't keep an hour. It's Father's Day. Just, you know, just let him up, and we went an hour and a half. I could go another hour and a half with you. Same. Um, and uh, just real quick, uh, to I think one of the things when it comes to digital marketing, you know, I went to school, uh, it, it, not to drag us on too much longer, but when I showed up at college, I had no intention of taking another math class, right? I was well ahead in high school. I'd completed my requirements. They made me take one course to get my units that, that I had earned. 
And I had a wonderful teacher and he said, hey, you're halfway done. Why don't you finish this thing out? And I did. I left college planning on never doing a piece of math again. I stumbled my way into a tutoring job to pay some bills. I ended up buying the business. I tutored math for the next eight, you know, eight years. I left that. I started a basketball website with no intention of doing online marketing, certainly not for doctors. I kind of stumbled my way into it uh, with a friend, and now here I am, right? So all of that is to say that when it comes to, when it comes to marketing and when it comes to the Internet, most people are kind of stumbling their way through this. So if you're a dentist out there and it's daunting and it's scary, that's normal. No one says, I'm going to grow up to be a dentist so I can have the best dental website in the world. And my, and my online marketing is going to be thriving. We're here to help. Every one of the things that we've talked about on this call today, a dentist could do themselves. With enough time, with enough research, you, no one, I didn't go to school for digital marketing. Nobody did. I don't know if there's some new degrees popping up now. It's all learned on the job. So you can do it. Your staff can do it. But it always comes down to time versus money. And if you're trading hours that you could be in, uh, seeing people in the chair or you're trading hours that you could be administering the sides of the business that I can't help you with, are you actually coming out ahead versus a monthly bill of anywhere from one to $1,500? That's the decision you have to make. But don't be afraid of it. If you get in there with some help and some pieces of advice and some honesty, that's really what it all comes down to. Uh, you know, my product's not for everyone, and I try to be sure to let people know when they're not the right fit instead of just taking them on board. Um, I think you'll get through it and you'll actually find it to be one of the most fulfilling parts of your practice because it's your way to speak to the world, right? Dental, I, I have to imagine if I asked you about Dental Town, just the number of stories that you would have from people in every corner of the globe and the ways that it affected them that you never could have seen coming when you started the thing. And while not on a global scale, your website can often do the same thing. They see that before after picture and they think, oh my God, there is hope for me. And my, and my condition that I've got, this guy had it. And look at what happened, uh, you know, six months, a year later with some regular visits. That's, that's kind of how you want to think of, of your website and your online marketing, your ability to speak to the world. So they can um, contact you if they go to doctormultimedia.com. Do you give out your email number, anything else, or should they oh, just go to Dr. Multimedia? I mean, if you need to reach our company as a whole, it's just info, I-N-F-O, at doctormultimedia.com. If you have questions for me in, in particular, I'm Praz Murthy, and hopefully on the podcast we can have the correct spelling of that, Praz Murthy at drmultimedia.com. But again, if I'm asking you to remember any of those things, I'm already failing at what I've told you on this show. Just go to the website, drmultimedia.com. The very first thing you'll see is a quick contact form. Less than 10 seconds, you can submit your question. Even my current clients use that sometimes because it's so much easier to just go to a website, type away, then try to open up their email, type my email in, deal with the bounce. You go to drmultimedia.com, send us a question, we'll get right back to you, usually with an under, under 12 hours usually, but I, I'll promise 24. So on, on the most sacred holiday of the year, St. Patrick's Day, do you change your name from Murphy to Murphy? <laughs> Yes. On those days, I don't correct the spelling when I'm making reservations. <laughs> I just say M-U-R-T-H-Y, and everybody writes it down P-H-Y. So I only have to say T is in Tom when, uh, when I'm worried about an email address getting sent to the wrong place. All right. Well, man, you this was just uh, rock and roll. Thank you so much for this uh, hour and a half. This was just amazing. And, Ryan, we should, uh, when this podcast comes out, post under dental marketing. And uh, I wish you would go in on that ADA post and uh, say what you said about the ADA because it's already causing total hysteria. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much, Howard. I, I don't exactly know how you found us, but I was very appreciative you reached out. Thank you, Ryan. I found you on Dentaltown. For, for all the work that you did uh, in scheduling this, you know, I could talk all day about it. It wasn't a passion uh, of mine initially, but, you know, as experience ha has made it such uh, and we're here to help. So absolute pleasure. Couldn't have imagined a better way to spend uh an hour and a half this morning and uh, to all the listeners out there uh, you know you're part of an amazing website keep it up the the conversations you all have on that website help thousands of people you never see or hear from because I get questions about your website all the time from people that are not on there so keep doing what you're doing on on the website and answering questions and and pushing the envelope because uh, the dental industry is catching up in the online world. There's still a long ways to go, but they've made some serious strides over the last five now, years. Now go tell your doctor dad that Dr. Ferran said that he should be very proud of his son. I'll do that. Thanks so much, Dr. Ferran.